okay, so uh, first off, just want to note, for next time you are reading uh, the excerpts from Dorothy Wordsworth's Al Fox and the Grassmere Journals, right? Now, um, one thing to remember as you're reading Dorothy Wordsworth, uh, think about what a journal is, right? And who it's intended for. What is a journal? Self-entry. Pardon? Like a self-entry journal, like yeah. writing and um, like it concludes of like their thoughts or experiences of that day. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, think of it as that kind of journal, right? Think of it as, as like a diary, right? And do we generally intend for a journal or a diary to be read by other people? So yeah, the big difference between what you're going to be reading in Dorothy Wordsworth and the other stuff we're doing in this class is that she's writing things that were never intended for public consumption, right? So it's not arranged for publication the way most of what we've been looking at um, has been. So yeah, just keep that in mind as you're reading. Um, now, the music I was playing at the beginning of class um, is... <coughs> a tribute to the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner recorded in 1984 by Iron Maiden. Now, this was partly just because, to be honest, I friggin' love Iron Maiden, and I will use any excuse I can to force my enthusiasm for them on other people. Um, but <clears throat> also to, as a way into talking about this poem, right? Um, what elements does this poem have that would make it appealing to a heavy metal band. I mean, there's death. Okay. Yeah. Uh, death, uh, this, uh, I guess like sailing, maybe. Maybe. Okay. What? Well, why sailing? Um. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm yeah. just saying, yeah. I don't know. Um. But yeah, we've got you know we we right we've got these undead sailors right we got these this zombie crew. What else might make us a poem like this appealing to a heavy metal artist? If we think about the kinds of ideas we usually associate with heavy metal music. Damnation. Okay, yeah, this notion of like kind of like damnation and a curse, right? Good. What else? I think, you know, maybe not the sailing thing specifically, but something to do with sailing, right? You know, the idea of being alone on the sea, right? This kind of this idea of alienation, right? Right, being somehow cut off from society, cut off from other people. Right, metal songs often deal with those kinds of themes. Murder, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Is the death of the albatross treated just like killing an animal? Like hunting. No, yeah, it, it's it's treated in the poem as being an actual murder, right? The albatross is given a personality within the poem, and the mariner also can just kind of thoughtlessly kills it, right? Is there any motive offered? For the, for the murder of the albatross. Does the mariner ever explain why he did this? He does not, right? It's just left completely unexplained. He picks up his crossbow, he shoots the albatross, and that's it. Do you guys know what an albatross is, by the way? Yes, I like a seabird. Yeah, it is a, it, it is a seabird, yes, it is a very big seabird, right? Well, it, it's a seabird with very big wings and kind of a small body, right? 
So it's kind of like ungainly and clumsy and goofy on land because it's just this little bird trying to drag these giant wings around. But in the sky, it's incredibly graceful. But yeah, the death of the albatross is treated like a murder. with no motive offered, right? And there is, off, there, there is also kind of like a level of um, apparent symbolic depth to this poem, right? That a lot of your maybe more intellectually inclined metal bands might be attracted to, right? Like, Metal as a form of music is kind of famous for being what I like to call a comic book deep. Um, you know, the kind of deep that like a couple of teenage boys arguing over comic books uh, like to like to get, right? So I would argue that this poem probably isn't as symbolically deep as it appears to be, which we'll get to as we, we talk about it, but there is a the, the sort of the appearance certainly of symbolic depth. Plus, there are a couple of great places to put an eight-minute bass solo. So, <clears throat> Coleridge in particular has often drawn the attention of rock bands. Um, you know, this is by no means the only adaptation done by a hard rock act of a Coleridge poem. Um, the Canadian band Rush, for example, um, did a song called Xanadu which is an adaptation of Coleridge's poem Kublai Khan. Um, so romanticism in general tends to be attractive to hard rock acts. Um, and I think of it like as we continue to pull this poem apart and compare it to what's going on in Tintern Abbey, um, we'll start to see why. Um, how did this poem come? How did the experience of reading this compare to the experience of reading Tintern Abbey? What was different about this? It wasn't reflection-oriented. It was more just a story. OK, yeah, this has a narrative, right? Right, Tintern Abbey doesn't really tell a story. It's a description of a situation, right? But yeah, this tells a definite story. And the action is less internal, right? What else is different about this from Tintern Abbey? Is the language any different? I forgot what page number is it. <laughs> they resemble each other. Uh, this is a little more structured though. Yeah, this is uh, Mm -hmm. rhythm. Yeah, this the, yeah this poem has a very regular rhythm, very regular line length, stanza patterns, right? So yeah, it, it is much more what we would call metrically regular. Good. And which of the two poems had more kind of contemporary sounding language? Tintern Abbey or this one? Which one seemed to be more kind of backward looking? The piece, the rhyme piece? Yeah, this one seems a little bit, there, there are things about it that seem kind of old fashioned, right? And these were some of the features of the poem that, um, made it frustrating to its original readers. Now, 
this poem was published several times over Coleridge's life, often with revisions. So the version that we have in the textbook is the 1817 version. The 1798 version, right, the original publication in the first volume of Lyrical Ballads, um, has a lot of like old-fashioned spellings, and doesn't include those little glosses in the margins that explain to you what's happening, right? So the original version of the poem was much harder, even for a reader in 1798, uh, to comprehend. But yeah, so <clears throat> Coleridge is engaging in deliberate archaism here. And this is a tried and true strategy in English poetry. Um, for example, um, in the 16th century, um, Edmund Spencer's uh, long poem, The Fairy Queen, um, which is you know, about questing knights, each of whom represents um, a particular virtue, right, is written in a form of English that would have been old fashioned even by the late 16th century, right? So oftentimes when poets would, would be writing these narrative poems on backward looking subjects, they would adopt an old fashioned style and old fashioned language. And I think that this makes sense when we think about the word romantic, capital R. The word itself is taken from several romantic writers' enthusiasm for the Middle Ages. Right? Romance, in literary terms, refers to what? Does anybody know what a romance is in, liter in literary terms? Think chivalric romance, knightly romance. We talked about this. Okay. So romance is a long narrative of aristocratic, specifically usually knightly adventure. So, you know, knights going off and having adventures in forests and things like that, you know, I mean, rescuing maidens from dragons, um, things of that nature, right? So, <clears throat> a lot of romantic poetry of the late 18th and early 19th centuries draws on these kind of late medieval traditions, right? Not so much in the way of architecture um, and plot structure as the Gothic did, um, but um, in terms, like in thematic terms, certainly. So yeah, this is meant to be kind of deliberately backward looking. But the romance is an aristocratic genre. And Coleridge writes this poem in a decidedly non-aristocratic metrical pattern. So we already mentioned, right, the name of the book in which this first appeared was Lyrical Ballads, published 1798, and it was a joint effort between Wordsworth and Coleridge. Wordsworth contributed most of the poems but because this poem was so long, um, <clears throat> their contribution still ended up being about 50-50. So the name Lyrical Ballads was chosen for a particular reason. Does anybody know what a lyric is? We talked about the greater romantic lyric last time. But does anybody know what, a, what the word lyric means when we're talking about poetry?
Okay, so a lyric poem. Pardon? Maybe like the words or like the, the style. Yeah, well, yeah, when we talk about music, right? A song, the song lyrics are just the words to the song, right? Um, but yeah, so when we talk about poetry, a lyric poem is non-narrative and is intended to describe a mood or situation rather than to tell a story. Now, ballads, on the other hand, are narrative folk poems. And ballads have a couple of typical features. Right, first, they usually begin what we call in media race, which in Latin means in the middle of the story. So a ballad doesn't usually give you the entire tale. It usually starts somewhere in the middle. Um, they were also orally transmitted Folk ballads exist in variant forms. Right, so the same ballad may, ex may, you know, may exist in a number of different versions, right? Usually uh, the differences are regional, somewhere, regional, right? Um, and they tend to follow the same stanza pattern. There's not like a set number of syllables or stresses you find in a ballad line, um, but you find alternating long short, long short lines in a four line stanza, usually rhymed A, B, C, B. So the short lines are rhymed, the long lines are not. This is exactly the stanza pattern, right, that Coleridge writes most of this poem in. There are a couple of uh, six-line stanzas, usually when you know some kind of big action is happening. Um, but yeah, by and large, what we have are these ballad stanzas. And ballads were big in the 18th century. They were part of this antiquarian craze that inspired the Gothic. Um, <clears throat> there was a fellow by the name of Thomas Percy who published a book called Relics of Ancient English Poetry. that collected ballads from across Britain. And Wordsworth and Coleridge both would have been familiar uh, with this book, um, in large part because it was kind of like, at least among educated people who cared about poetry, um, it was pretty much ubiquitous, right? This is an incredibly popular work and serves as an inspiration to uh, much of what's going on in the Romantic movement. So what lyrical battle, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. All right, what's, uh, Thomas Percy, what's that, is that an R or P, sorry? What's Here? That's an R. That's an R, relics. Yep. Okay, okay. But, but spelled funny with a Q rather than with a Z. That's fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so by calling the collection lyrical ballads, what Wordsworth and Coleridge are trying to signal is that they're combining two different ideas of poetry into some into a new fusion, right? They're combining the moody situational lyric with the traditional narrative ballad, right? They're combining what is typically 
an upper to upper middle class tradition, the lyric, with the folk tradition, the ballad, and in so doing, trying to revitalize both. Um, now, I'd like to turn uh, for a second to page 497. Uh, to Coleridge's comments on the composition of lyrical ballads. This is from a book he wrote much later called Biographia Literaria, um, in which he discussed his, uh, his life in literature and his theories on life, the universe, and everything. So can I get somebody to read for us on page 497, the middle paragraph that starts with, in this idea originated the plan of lyrical ballads. In this idea, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. In this idea originated the plan of the lyrical ballads, in which it was agreed that my endeavors should be directed to persons and characters supernatural or at least romantic, yet as yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of true significant to procure for these shadows of imagination that will that willingly suspension of disbelief for the moment which can uh, constitutes yes poetic faith mr wordsworth on the other hand was to propose to himself as an object to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite a feeling and on Analogous, oh, analogous. Analogous. Mm -hmm. To the supernatural by awakening, by awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of uh, custom and directing it to the lovingness and wonders of the world before us, and an exhaustively treasure, but which for in consequence of the film. Uh, familiarity and selfish solic solicitude. Yep. Solicitude. Mm -hmm. Doing fine. We, Keep going. We have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and heathers that neither feel nor understand. Okay. Thank you. So, how did they divide up the work here then? What's What's Coleridge's subject and what's Wordsworth's subject? Wordsworth is the touchy feel again. You know, he wants to evoke <laughs> emotion. Coleridge is more of the valid story for the guy. Okay. So yeah, so we got yeah, here you know, the, the lyric guy and the ballad guy, right? But what else is what else is different in the work that they're doing? Uh, supernatural? Yeah, which one of them is responsible for the tales of the supernatural? Coleridge and Wordsworth, that's like everyday objects. Yeah, so yeah, Coleridge is giving us these tales of the supernatural. While Wordsworth is giving us poems that defamiliarize the everyday, right? Good. Now, this is written uh, with about, eh, let's say, like, you know, about you know, 20 years of hindsight. So you know, Coleridge's memories on these points aren't exact. In fact, there's a lot more overlap between the two than this would suggest. Um, and they often helped each other with the poems they were writing. For example, Wordsworth actually composed a couple of stanzas of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and suggested the uh, episode of the Albatross as a kind of catalyst for the Mariner's damnation. Um, Coleridge also added stanzas to several of Wordsworth's poems. So it was very much a joint effort between these two, between these two young poets. Um, now, the other thing that I want to uh, talk a little bit about before we get into the specifics of the poem 
is Coleridge's theory of the imagination. Now again, this is something that's not fully developed in 1798 when he first writes this poem. Uh, but over the course of 20 years, um, he comes up with this idea that becomes quite influential both for romantic poets and for poets that come after. So can I get somebody to look on page 496 and read uh, the excerpt here from chapter 13 on the imagination or esimplastic power? The imagination then I consider, oh, the imagination mm -hmm. then I consider either a primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the finite I am. The secondary I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primer, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still identical. I just read that twice. Uh, Okay, start, yes. start back from the secondary I consider. The secondary I consider as an echo of the former coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of, in the kind of its agency, and suffering only in degree. And in the mode of its operation, it dissolves, diffuses, dissipates, in order to recreate or where this process is rendered impossible. Yet still, at all events, it struggles to idealize and to unify. It is essentially vital, even as all objects, as objects, are essentially fixed and dead. Okay, so let's pause for a minute here and focus on what exactly he seems to mean by imagination, because this all seems a little bit abstract, right? So, Primary imagination. I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. So there's a religious dimension to this, right? So <clears throat> primary imagination is essentially the way we create the world in perceiving it, right? This theory owes rather a lot um, to those 18th century empir empiricists, um, like a lot of romanticism does, um, who talked about the way we can construct the world out of our senses, right? Secondary imagination is creation through the application of our conscious will, right? So we take these things that we perceive in the world, we melt them down into something new, right? We don't just move them around in our brain. We take in sense impressions and we consciously put them into new situations and new forms, right? So this is, for Coleridge, the most important human creative power, right? Now, can somebody read for us this, the next paragraph where he talks about fancy? Fancy, on the contrary, Thank has you, no other counter to play with but fixities and definites. The fancy is indeed no other than a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space and blended with and modified by the um, by that empirical phenomenon of the will which we express by the world, choice. But equally with the ordinary memory, it must receive all of its materials ready-made from the law of association. Yeah, thank you. I thought you were the best reader in the class. <laughs> so, what's, 
What is fancy then? How is fancy different from imagination? Like by choice. Um, it's just like a memory. It's something like fixated. Yeah, um, it's, it's just, yeah, he said it's really just kind of an advanced form of memory, right? Mm -hmm. And the fancy doesn't create anything new, right? So while imagination takes in sense impressions, melts them down, and makes something new with them, the fancy just takes in sense impressions and moves them around, right? You don't make anything new, you're just rearranging things that you have experienced, right? So while you may go out and see a horse and a goat, right? If you are a writer who only has resource, you know, who only has fancy as a resource, right? You don't really have the power of imagination. You know, you may then, you know, create some sort of, you know, animal parade or circus situation where you have a, a horse or a goat together, right? If you're using your imagination to act upon these things, you melt them down and create a unicorn, right? So yeah, the big difference is that these both are involved with the way we deal with our sense impressions, but imagination creates fancy just moves our sense impressions around. All right. <clears throat> So now that we've dealt with a lot with Coleridge's basic theoretical orientation here, let's kind of dig into the poem a little bit. What did you guys think of this poem? How did it go for you? I read it looking through trying to find a point to it, and then I found a footnote at the end saying there really wasn't a point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what made you feel that this was pointless? There didn't seem to be a moral at the end. Okay. All, all that was learned was that some guy killed an albatross in cold murder. Uh huh. Blood. And then suddenly his crewmates just just fall over dead. He drifts for a little while, and then he reaches a, an island. Well, no, he doesn't reach that. His mm -hmm. his crewmates come back to life somehow. Yeah. He just tries trying to accept that. He finds an island, he finds a hermit, and then he has a dream where he is the albatross, I think. No, that, 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 that doesn't happen. But I think like what you're hitting on here is actually one of the debates that people have been having about this poem since it was published. There are actually some critics who think it has an overly heavy-handed moral. There is a kind of moral that the mariner expresses at the end, right? Um, and there is a kind of lesson learned through um, the mariner's experiences, right? So if we turn to page 463, um, around line 597 here, a wedding guest the soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me, to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. To walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, 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 but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. So this is the expressed moral of the poem, right? So what does it seem to be? Like what, what does the mariner seem to be apologizing for? Cold blood, right? Yeah, for the cold-blooded killing of the albatross, right? 
But is he saying that like God forgave him and that's why his curse was lifted? Uh yes. And what was it that happened that allowed for his forgiveness? Uh, he repented. Yeah, specifically. If we go back to part four of the poem, page 454, right. <clears throat> when he's alone on the ship with nothing but the bodies of the dead crew, right? The many men so beautiful and they all dead did lie. And a thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them close, and the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, no rot nor reek did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high. But oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up in a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main like April hoarfrost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire. Blue, glossy green, and velvet black, they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. O oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. So the reason why I read this whole long passage here is because we see a like from the beginning to the end of this a change in attitude, right? What did he call the water snakes when he was thinking about the corpses of his crewmates lying all around him? The many men so beautiful and they all dead did lie, and a thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I, right? So he's disgusted by these other sea creatures, right? And then when he learns to appreciate the beauty of these creatures and to bless them, right? The curse starts to break. The albatross falls off of his neck, right? Because he's applying it to himself. Like he kind of like forgave himself what he did. Well, does it seem like he needs to forgive himself? There are these spirits following him around, right, that keep punishing him. It's, yeah, it's like, it's like they're doing it, but like, uh -huh. he did, like you just said, he has to see the, I guess you could say, the, the beauty in nature. Yeah, like yeah. He has basically like the, uh, like the other poem, like he has to appreciate it. Yeah, he has to essentially like show respect for non-human nature, right? And it's when he can do that that the curse starts to lift. Now, I'm going to complicate this a bit. Right? This seems like a relatively simple moral, right? He prayeth best, who loveth best, best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all, right? But then, that's not where the poem ends, right? We get these last two stanzas. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn, 
a sadder and a wiser man. He rose the morrow morn. So does learning this lesson leave the wedding guest any better off? Not sad, but uh, not the sad sense, but I guess the wise. Uh, but now overall, probably not. Yeah, I mean, let's think about the basic situation here as well, right? So we've got this this crazy old man who shows up, stops a guy on his way to a wedding feast, right? Forces him to sit and listen to this batshit crazy tale, right? And the guy listening to the story is unable to go in and join the party, right? And when he's done listening to the story, instead of going in and joining everyone else, he goes home by himself in sadness, right? And what was like, you know, a, a big part of the manor's message here, right, was the, you know, everybody should walk together to, to the church to pray, right? And yet, what he's done to the wedding guest is isolated him and left him alone. Now, I think it's also probably worth thinking about whether or not the mariner is actually forgiven for what he did. Why did he stop the wedding guest in the first place? Um, to uh, talk about this to somebody. Um, uh -huh. Basically, so like, I guess kind of like repenting. Yeah, like, does, does he do this because he wants to do it or because he feels like doing it. He's compelled to, right? We look a little uh, on page 463 again. Since then, in an uncertain hour, that agony returns. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him, my tale I teach. So, this compulsion to tell the story suggests that he is not quite forgiven. Right? If he were forgiven, he could simply go on living his life happily, right? But he can't. Every now and again, he's struck with this fit and has to go out and tell his tale to some unlucky soul, right? I think it's also important to think about, again, like the fact, like, what he's interrupting here. So he's giving us a message of, you know, community and love and brotherhood, right? And if we think about, like, the kind of spiritual message that the Mariner presents here, do you guys know what pantheism is? Anybody familiar with this word? Okay, so it comes from two Greek words, right? Teos, which means God or a god, and pan, which means all or everything. So putting those two together, what would you assume pantheism means? Yeah, God in everything, right? So a pantheist believes that there is a kind of divine, that the, like the, 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 yeah, the divine exists in everything all around us, right? 
that there is some divine spirit in everything. Which seems to be the overall message, the overall message the mariner is communicating, right? You know, this kind of inclusive spirituality. But then if we go back to the beginning of the poem, page 448, it is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stopst thou me? The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand, there was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, graybeard loon, soon as his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye, the wedding guest stood still, and listens like a three years child, the mariner hath his will. The wedding guest set on a stone he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. So what's the first thing we notice about the mariner's action here? Does he stop all three of these guys who are on the way to the wedding? He only stops one, yeah. So the wedding guest is singled out. And I think it would also help if we think about what exactly a wedding is, right? Just on the base literal level, what is a wedding? Marriage of two people, right? And by marry, and when two people marry, what else then gets combined? Family. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's you know the formation of a family, right? Um, you know, two families coming together. So this is a kind of so a wedding is creation and affirmation. of community ties. Right, you're binding people together. Right, and you invite guests, you invite relatives, friends, neighbors to come and join the celebration, right? At least you do in normal times when there's not a pandemic raging. So, the whole idea of a wedding, right, is you know, like, is the, the, yeah, this affirmation of community bonds and community ties, which seems to be exactly the kind of thing that the mariner is trying to promote in his moral, but it's also exactly the thing he's excluding the wedding guest from, right? And we keep getting these glimpses of the wedding as the mariner is telling his tale. Right, there's a point at which you know the wedding guest can hear the loud bassoon. Um, there's a point at which um, you know the bride steps in. You know they can he, you know they can hear the the noise and the the noise of the party outside, right? But at no point does the wedding guest get up and go in. Now we can also probably relate this to the mariner's own story, right? How does the mariner's situation parallel the isolation of the wedding guest here? He has, in fact, been, been isolated from a community, right? When his journey starts out, he's part of a crew. But then through his action, the rest of the crew dies. They're all punished for something he did. And he's left alone. 
He's being compelled to tell people they're being compelled to listen because it's saying like he cannot choose but to hear. So he kind of has no choice but to listen to the Murner story. Yeah. And I think, like, has any, did any of you notice that they talk a lot about eyes and glances? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The mariner can't hold the wedding guest with his hand, right? What can he hold him with? His voice. I just he said eyes and something about, well, it said something about the beard and that, but it's saying, like, his, uh-huh. his, like, glazing eyes. Yeah, he holds him with his glittering eye, right? Yeah, and the eye, let's actually like focus on this for a second and just try to pull out this pattern, right? So here we have you know, the mariner's glittering eye holding the wedding guest still. Uh, we're, like, if we're even just looking at passages that we have already looked at, where else have we seen an eye? Go back to page 455, right, when he's looking at the dead men on the deck, right? Yeah, because he says he can't, like, it stays in his head for seven days and seven nights. Yeah, the curse in a dead man's eye, right? The crew looking at him. Um, part of it, but I, I think it, it's also part of a larger pattern of like a like, kind of symbolic pattern that's going on with eyes here. So we got the curse in the dead man's eye. Um, where? Oh, there was something else. Um, Well, yeah, the eye seems typically throughout the poem. Right, if we look on page 454, as well, just before this, as the men are falling down, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Right? So it seems like the eye. Yeah, it's supernatural, and it, like, it has a kind of supernatural power, right? It seems to have the supernatural power both to hold and to accuse, right? Usually when we see these glances, it's a kind of reminder, it's an, it's an indicator of guilt, right? or a kind of accusation, right? As the dead men fall to the deck and they're looking at the mariner, right? It's like, this is your fault, you fucker, right? Now, they've also been silent all this time, right? Right after the death of the albatross, the ship is blown off course further, right? To a place where they can't move. Um, There's no wind, there's no tide, the ship is just stuck in the blazing hot sun. But if you look on page uh, 451, The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, to as sad as sad could be. And we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon. Right up above the mast did stand no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we struck nor breath nor motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. 
The very deep did rot, O Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, and reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. So part of the punishment, like part of the crew's overall punishment, seems to be this kind of enforced silence, right? They're in the silent sea. Their tongues are withered, right? Nobody can speak, but they can give the man evil looks, and instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung, right? So they can indicate through glances and through symbolic gestures that the mariner is to blame. But I think, like, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but I think there's something important going on here with the, the overall silencing of the crew and the fact that the mariner, the only survivor, is compelled to tell this story every so often, right? He can't, like, he can't help but speak. He's forced to speak by some power beyond himself. And he has to speak for those who have been silenced. So I'm starting to put this together in my head, but I'm not really quite sure what the whole picture looks like yet. Every time I teach this poem, I kind of hit on something, we, we hit on something new um, that I hadn't really thought much about before because it's a weird looking poem, right? So, the crew are marooned, silent, rocking about in a boat. And then what happens? What appears on the horizon? The skeleton of the ship. Yeah, these weird skeleton ships, right? Death. And life in death. Now, life in death is not any kind of known symbolic or allegorical figure. She seems to be... Coleridge's own invention. And the way she's described, it seems almost like she's brought in here as a kind of opposite number for the bride, right? There are only two female figures in the poem, life and death and the bride. And so if we go back to part one of the poem and the way the bride is described. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she. Nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. So the bride is clearly marked as red as a rose. And what do we, like, what do we tend to associate this kind of redness with? If somebody has nice red cheeks or something like that. Youth. Yeah, with youth and health, right? And the merry minstrelsy, or the fact that she's accompanied by these merry minstrelsy, right? She is part of a community, she's participating in a community ritual, right? Her whole function as, you know, she's named here by her function, bride, right? A central player in this community drama. Now, life and death, on the other hand, her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was white as leprosy. The nightmare life and death was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. So her lips are red and she has these locks yellow as gold, but her skin is white as leprosy. Bride is healthy, red as a rose, right? 
Life and death is described in terms that suggest disease. Right? Unhealth. Right? The opposite of health. And her function is not to affirm community ties, but to break them. Right? She's playing this weird dice game with her counterpart, Death. She wins. And as such, the mariner is forced to live on while everyone around him dies, right? So she is a force not for community affirmation, but for isolation within the community. And who's the only member of the crew who is able to speak? when they see these ships coming. The yeah, it's the mariner, right? Who speaks, right? He, he, you know, his throat is so dry, he has to bite his arm and suck the blood in order to, in order to be able to speak, right? But yeah, the mariner is the only one of the crew that still has any power of speech. So we kind of see this kind of this continuous kind of singling out and isolating, right? Something that the mariner will repeat in singling out the wedding guest. So there are a couple of theories about what's going on in this poem, like what might, um, like how we might read it in terms of its particular background. Um, one reading that is fairly popular is that the curse that afflicts the men on the ship is actually yellow fever. Because the symptoms that are described uh, on page 452, right? With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could not, we could nor laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried a sail, a sail. The, the dehydration and the blackened lips in particular are suggestive of a tropical disease called yellow fever. And yellow fever was particularly common among slave traders. Now, we already know from past experience what Coleridge thought about the slave trade, right? Does anybody remember uh, from a couple of sessions ago Coleridge's arguments about the slave trade and what to do about it? Sugar yeah. And, um, yeah, he wanted. Yeah, he was trying to get people to boycott sugar and rum to disrupt the slave trade because you know these kind of like the, the, the sorts of things that um, Britons used to give themselves pleasure to give themselves enjoyment. Right, he was arguing were actually like tainted with the blood of slaves. Right, and I think that. There's something going on here that suggests something similar. And for one thing, if we look at the route the mariner follows, and I actually have a uh, map here I can show you. If you're paying attention to um, 
<clears throat> things he describes like the position of the sun. You can tell where it is he's actually, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he goes from England down to the equator. That's where they first get blown off course. They end up down in Antarctica. And then they get blown up north into the Pacific. And then who knows how he gets back to England. Spirits seem to take care of that, right? But he does somehow get back to England. So, what some critics have suggested is that the primary reason a ship from England in 1798 would be sailing in this direction would be to make that leg in the trade triangle journey, right? To go pick up slaves in Africa and then take them over to North America. But the Mariner ship gets blown off course before that can happen. So that part of the Mariner's sin and the sin of the crew is this inability to value human life, right? This inability to value all lives as equally human. And I think that that would actually kind of accord well with what happens to the wedding guest, right? Because remember again that speech about like when he's talking about boycotting the sugar trade, right? He is telling people specifically to deny themselves pleasures because those pleasures are tainted. And here he is actually stopping the wedding guest from going in and participating in a pleasurable event, right? He's stopping the guy from going in and having fun with his friends and his family by telling him a story about nightmares on the sea. So, I'm not 100% sure on this, and I might be overthinking it a little bit, but I kind of think there's a relationship between that boycott message, that boycott lecture, and what the mariner is doing to the wedding guest. Right? The, the mariner is a kind of reminder of what's propping up things like the wedding feast. And unfortunately, when you know where your pleasures come from, it's harder to take pleasure in them. And so the wedding, the wedding guest goes home, a sad and wiser man. Well, that is um, pretty much all I wanted to say about this. Do you guys have any questions about anything? Yeah, Hannah. Um, one of the things that kind of confused me was they were talking about like demons and like angelic spirits. Yes. I kind of didn't know where that came into play. Okay, so um, Coleridge, uh, read a lot of weird books. <laughs> uh, one of his interests was in a field of late, you know, like late ancient Greek philosophy called Neoplatonism. So Plato believed that everything in the world of our senses, right, was just an imitation of some idea, right? Something that existed only in the mental realm. Neoplatonists took this a little bit further and argued that there was this kind of, there was this kind of world spirit that had created everything. And then there were these other emanations of this world spirit that had created um, and that had tried to imitate it and had uh, marred the creation by mucking up the physical world, right? So a Neoplatonist believed that there were spirits in everything. And this also kind of goes along with the whole idea of pantheism, right? That you know, everywhere the mariner goes, there's another spirit following. Right? There's a spirit in the ice and snow that wants to avenge the albatross. There are these other two spirits that he hears talking. These, you know, kind of, they're not devils, they're not angels, they're nature spirits, right? Arguing about his fate. 
So that's kind of where that's coming from, right? Does that make sense to you? Whether it makes sense or not doesn't answer your question. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else? Okay, so let me give you then the guide questions for Dorothy Wordsworth. And we'll see you on Wednesday.